Yes, sir. I, I, I just wanted to say, Ireland, they say, has the honor of being the only country in the world that never persecuted the Jews. Did you know that? No. And do you know why? Why, sir? Because she never let them in. <laughs> <laughs> That's the why. She never let them in. <laughs> That's why. On a winter's afternoon, the 30th of January, 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of the Third Reich and phase one of the final solution was activated. It is generally assumed that the Irish played no part in the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. But Ireland, like any other corner of the earth, was viewed as a potential haven by Jews and others fleeing Hitler's regime. For the lucky few, it did indeed become a haven. However, as with many other governments, gaining sanctuary became a diabolical game of bureaucracy versus humanitarianism, pragmatism versus good intentions, of luck and personal kindness pitted against prejudice, or at times, just plain indifference. Prior to Hitler, for the bulk of Germany's predominantly middle-class Jews, anti-Semitism was an occupational hazard, a nagging feeling that a glass ceiling existed in certain institutions and professions. All that was inexorably changed by Hitler's rise to power. The government has been faithful to the anti-Semitic portion of the Nazi program. It has endeavored to oust the Jew from public offices, the press, the theater, the academies of arts, the professions, and business. The legation has seen a marked increase in inquiries and applications mostly from Jews of Polish or Eastern European nationality. As far as possible, the legation has discouraged such persons from going to Ireland as they are really only refugees. It assumes that this line of action would be in accordance with government policy. Imbued with the insight that the purity of German blood is prerequisite for the continued existence of the German people, and inspired by the inflexible will to ensure the existence of the German nation for all times, the Reichstag has unanimously adopted the following law, which is hereby promulgated. Following the so-called Nuremberg Laws, the Reich Citizenship Act and the Blood Protection Act, German Jews were no longer citizens, but subjects. Marriage and sexual relationships between Jews and citizens of Germany were forbidden and punishable by penal servitude. Based on the ideology that Jews constituted an inferior race, it followed that it was valid to remove them from all walks of German life and replace them with Aryans. All of these actions, deprivation of livelihood, of property and assets, had one aim. Germany was to become Judenrein, clean of Jews. In 1933 alone, 30,000 decide to leave. An emigration tax was imposed which climbed steeply, with the result that Jews who did not emigrate early, and they were the majority, were frequently pauperized, thus creating the most undesirable class of refugee imaginable, often penniless, but more important, stateless. No country relished the prospect of aliens they could not repatriate or deport and as Jewish emigration from Germany rapidly accelerated, it became obvious that this particular outpouring of humanity was, in essence, unwanted. In the case of a Charles Schneider, in authorizing their entry, one must recognize the fact that there is every likelihood that it will be impossible to deport them to Germany. The Jewish problem was not going to go away, and governments now increasingly besieged for refuge had to find a polite way of saying, 
in all seriousness. Terribly sorry, have you tried Madagascar? In 1936, the League of Nations High Commission for Refugees failed to persuade reluctant governments to relax their ever-tightening immigration restrictions, specifically to Jewish refugees. As far as refugees coming from Germany, and in particular Jewish refugees, are concerned, the committee has noted that relative facilities for colonization in Palestine, South America, and elsewhere open up wide prospects. Anywhere looked attractive, as long as it wasn't their own backyard. Still experiencing the teething problems of independence, Ireland was a country of emigration, not immigration, and in line with Britain, did not regard itself as a contender for welcoming migrants. The theory that the Department of Justice seems to have entertained at that time was that any uh, large group of people of a different religion, uh, they would probably use the term different race, uh, would be disruptive to the Irish people, would cause discontent, and would generally disturb the peace in Ireland, and therefore we were better off not letting these people in in the first place. Irish policy decisions frequently mimicked English establishment attitudes, but the issue of who and what was alien to Ireland formed part of an ongoing cultural nationalism debate. Councillor Cotclough. Councillor Mrs. Kessel. Dominant was a fervent Gaelic Catholic ethos of communal values and cultural nationalism, exclusive and conformist, with little space for dissenting values. The idea of the Jews coming in and taking over our country and taking over our trade and taking over our jobs was as strong here as it was in other areas of Europe. Uh, you know, it was quite common for in the Sinn Féin newspaper, for example, uh, for you know, tailors to advertise themselves saying only Irish labour, you know, no Jewish labour, uh, etc, etc. And this would have run right through to the 1930s. I suppose what you're really getting in part is a very put-upon population with desperate for work themselves and very organisable into uh, xenophobic movements of one kind or another. Fear of the English, fear of Protestants, fear of the Jews, fear of anybody outside, not of our own. Uh, very much a pretty typical post-peasant society. But this mood of cultural protectionism did not cut Ireland off from the contemporary world. The Free State was now a member of the League of Nations. In my capacity as President of the Council, I have the honour to declare open the 13th ordinary session of the Assembly of the League of Nations. Appeals on the worsening German situation were now being made directly to Ireland's Premier Statesman, Eamon de Valera. The avoidance of wars... As a brother Irishman and a Catholic, may I appeal to you to do your utmost to relieve the persecuted Jews and Catholics under those thugs, Hitler and Gore. As the decade progressed, Robert Briscoe, former IRA gunrunner and now Jewish TD, became increasingly involved in lobbying for the refugee cause. In May 1936, he was informed by Eamon de Valera. While he had the fullest sympathy for the rights of minorities in all countries, he could not commit himself to any definite line of action in anticipation of any discussion on the whole Jewish case which might take place at Geneva. That discussion, a League of Nations attempt to obtain legal status for refugees, was signed by only seven member countries, excluding Ireland. My father tried very, very hard on behalf of the Jewish community. And when you say he was the official spokesman, he was the only Jewish member of the Irish Parliament at that time at the door. And uh, consequently, he did have the ear of de Valera, the cabinet, and he could go into certain departments. They were actually buying old ships. They were raising money to buy these old ships, and they were shipping Jews into Palestine. My father got leave of absence from the door uh, on one occasion for over six months in order to and uh, de Valera gave him that support. In 1936, realising that Ireland was severely under-industrialised, the Council of German Jewry in England, emphasising the success of German Jewish manufacturers in England and Holland, proposed that there might be openings for the establishment of a relatively small number of new enterprises in Ireland. Germany's loss could be Ireland's gain. 
The proposals from London highlighted the clash that could occur between government departments. It is the practice to consider on their merits proposals for starting or expansion of industries. Whether the proposals are sponsored by aliens on their own account or in association with nationals, and where the minister is of the opinion that the cooperation of aliens is essential for the successful conduct of an enterprise of value to the country. The Minister for External Affairs will be aware that there have been of recent years numerous protests concerning the numbers of alien Jews who have become established in this country and the Minister will not look with favour on any policy which might lead to an increase of that number. The community here raised funds. They raised funds for Zionist causes, in other words, to get Jews into Palestine by legal means. They also promised, through my father, to the Irish government, that any Jewish refugees who would be let into Ireland, that they would be responsible financially for them, that they would not be a burden on the state, but it still didn't seem to work. Uh, they still didn't let them in. The Department of Justice in particular seems to be quite determinedly anti-Semitic uh, as far as immigration was concerned. Uh, we have enough Jews here, we don't need any more. It's partly, it would partly be anti-Semitism, but it would partly be hostility to anybody who wasn't Catholic, which is not quite the same thing. Uh, they wanted to build a Catholic country. They did not want people in the country who did not share a Catholic outlook, a Catholic ethos. Justice officials in particular genuinely thought that if you opened the gates, the country would be awash with, with foreigners, not only Jews. You tolerated the ones you had, but you certainly didn't encourage more to come. The state also recognises the Church of Ireland, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, the Methodist Church, the Religious Society of Friends in Ireland, as well as the Jewish congregations. Very few people, except in the most extreme straits, brought about by political persecution in the late 1930s, particularly wanted to come to Ireland. It wasn't a particularly urbane, cosmopolitan society. It wasn't a particularly nice climate. And it certainly, as a deeply Catholic country, wasn't a very welcoming one. When Jean Lamas took up his post at Industry and Commerce, a strange interlocking, however, of Irish domestic policy with German policy did bring a number of Jewish entrepreneurs to Ireland. At the heart of a major initiative was Marcus Wittstum, a Polish Jew living in Ireland since the early 30s. He found a sympathetic ear in John McAlin, a Fianna Fáil senator. The whole exercise was really to get industry to Ireland, to get employment for Irish people. It certainly was not to save any Jewish lives. So. Senator McAlin on the board, Wittstum's first project, Les Modes Modernes, a hat factory in Galway, was officially opened by Sean Lamass on the 18th of July, 1938, and blessed by the Reverend Dr. Brown, Bishop of Galway. It was about, uh, about 120 workers there, and I knew uh, some of the farmers who were in charge. Mr. Philipson, who was the general manager, Mr. Zeiler, who was the technical manager, Madam Schwanks, who was the designer, and Mr. Lebin, uh, who was a supervisor there, and uh, Mr. Jacobs, who made the shapes, in, the timber shapes for the, for the ladies' hats. By the end of 1940, Wittstrom and his associates had also built Western hats in Castle Bar, with an output of over 10,000 men's hats a week, and a tie-in with the Galway factory, it brought badly needed employment to over 200 locals. The expertise for both these operations secured essential work permits and visas for some 16 European Jews. The factory was built in 1939, and it was to be twice the size but uh, due to the war, they had to cut back on it. All of the blocks were made on site. The frame of the factory was built of reinforced concrete. Then they built the blocks on site. The chimney itself was 120 feet in height. It took eight weeks to build that particular chimney. Well, I suppose when we start to work with it, there'd be about, uh, there must be, uh, uh, there'd be uh, over 120, maybe 100, up to 150. But I remember a lot more being about built right in it. I'm sure there was about the best part of 300, let's say. We started producing like roughly in 1942, and we were doing about anything from 15 dozen to 30 dozen a day hats. At this time now, we were only doing felt hats alone. 
second, Mr. Schmoke was the general manager, and uh, his second in command was Mr. Burgess. Then he had different supervisors in each department. He had Mr. Connors in the wool department. He had Mr. Clipper in the felting, Mr. Deelands in the uh, other wet department, and Mr. Fred Schmolke in the dye house. And uh, then he had Mr. Polese in the hat department, and uh, Mr. Glass then in the dispatch. You'd see them in the morning when they come in. They'd all shake hands with one another at the gate, like, and that was strange to us, you see. And they wore their coats just over their shoulders, you see. Now, sleeves were never put through them. They mixed with the people a lot in Castlebar. Their wives and children uh, were in the tennis club, and uh, they mixed with the people, and they were very well received by the people of Castlebar uh, because they brought employment. Imagine if uh, 12 or 13 Jewish businessmen came to this town now and created employment for 400 people, the red carpet would be out. Personally, I thought quite a few of the people that came in to show us how to make hats were chancers. Apart from Mr. Dealens and Mr. Pogus, I didn't think they know much. They were just lucky to get away from Europe to avoid a war. Wittstrom's efforts also encouraged Emil Hirsch to pull off a unique feat, bribing Nazi authorities he relocated almost his entire ribbon factory from Vienna to Longford. As part of the Hirsch deal, author George Clare's father, formerly an employee of the Banque des Pays, was to receive a visa and work permit as a ribbon weaver. Obviously, he wouldn't have become a ribbon weaver. He would have been, the t he was a chartered accountant, actually. Uh, he would have been chartered accountant of Hirsch ribbons and undoubtedly would then have become chartered accountant of quite a number of firms in Ireland, and that would have been all right. Nevertheless, despite the number of jobs created by Jewish enterprise in areas of the country that badly needed them, further applications from Wittstum in late 1940 were rejected by military intelligence. Wittstum is no more than an adroit company promoter. Evidently, he's been used by Jews to secure entry permits to this country. The Jewish community regarded him as having considerable influence in this connection. It was just Jews. They didn't want Jews. Are the ports a passage or are they fixtures? Most of them are fixtures. They're German speaking, but are they German born? Are they Aryans or Jews? All I know is they're from the continent. Isn't it a fact that permits have been issued to 132 German Jewish refugees to live in Galway? For the past six years, we have heard Fianna Fáil preach about industrialization. What has this meant? It has meant £1,000 a year jobs gone to Jews and foreigners who have been imported into this country. In a country of rampant unemployment, no more industries of any substance by Jewish refugee entrepreneurs were sanctioned. The Irish attitude towards all immigration was decidedly ungenerous. People of Jewish backgrounds uh, were particularly singled out, if you like, and regarded with disfavour in terms of applying to come into Ireland, whether as visitors or as permanent residents. So this idea of the foreigners as being out to, to rape the, the commercially gullible and innocent Irish is very, very strong. And so you don't want them getting control of your industries, even if you need them to set up your industries. And th that's a very strong impulse from the, the whole, from the Irish manufacturing sector. Irish Industry, published by the National Agricultural and Industrial Development Association, in quoting the Cork Examiner, spelt out its gung-ho attitude. The least observant in the streets of our principal cities cannot fail to be struck by the increasing number of foreign-looking businessmen owning foreign accents who frequent commercial and banking centres. Again in March 1943. Nader is fully alive to the evils of alien infiltration into all aspects, cultural, industrial, economic, financial and agricultural. There is only one cure. All aspects of alienism must be ruthlessly extirpated from our land. Uh, there were prominent industrialists who were to some extent probably out to feather their own nest and to some degree had very strange political ideas. People like J.J. Walsh, uh, former Cumberland Gale minister, who undoubtedly was deeply pro-German, who was undoubtedly wildly anti-Semitic, uh, and who, who himself did very well out of protection and was very anti uh, what he called alien with the exception of German. As the 30s advanced, Alien's procedure became Kafkaesque with all applications from Jewish refugees having to surmount not only the effect of local covert anti-Semitism, but also the labyrinthine working relationship between government departments. What required urgency met with the procrastination of a three-handed reel. 
My father's aunt, my grandmother's sister, lived in Berlin. In 1935, she appealed to my father for a visa, even a temporary one, to come to Ireland. And my father was unable to get his own aunt a visa, and she died in Auschwitz. All applicants were first vetted by Irish diplomatic representatives, whose main criteria were to establish if the applicant was... Financially solvent, free from infectious diseases, not a lunatic, not likely to jeopardize national security. At any point, German police and detective agents could be called upon to provide requisite character references. In March 1938, Germany unleashed an unresisted invasion and annexed Austria. The growing tide of German refugees was now swollen by over 120,000 Austrian Jews stripped of their citizenship. The uniform SA came up and fetched people out of threat, Jews, got them on the street, and they had to clean it. It actually happened to us. Irish government now had to make contingency arrangements lest some of this tide of humanity be turned in their direction. External affairs to all embassies and legations. Please note that from the 13th of June in 1938, holders of German and Austrian passports must obtain visas for direct entry into Ireland. The cost of a visa valid for 12 months will be 10 gold francs. For a transit visa, one gold franc. The main purpose for the establishment of a visa is to control entry into Ireland of persons who, for political or religious reasons, may wish to seek refuge in this country. One, that the legation will be fully satisfied with the bona fides of the applicants, and two, that the applicant is not of Jewish or partly Jewish origins or has no non-Aryan affiliations. Visa application cards carried no designation for religion, yet within a month, comments about the religion of applicants began to appear frequently on official communications, and a kind of informal vetting based on superficial criteria commenced. I would say from his appearance and his name, Dr. Gutmann is a Jew. In view of the instructions we have received from the department to the effect that Jewish refugees from Germany will be excluded from Ireland, I have informed him that I consider there is very little chance, if any, that he will be granted a visa for Ireland. From here on, it seems as if justices claim that to permit more Jews to enter Ireland might incite anti-Semitism defined policy. Jewish refugees being regarded and treated more as problematic trans-migrants than victims fleeing a murderous regime. Individuals did make private appeals in their favour, like the Briscoes getting onto De Valera, for example. And there was a De Valera, Fianna Foyle, uh, Jewish defence connection. But it doesn't seem to have got very far against the perception of public opinion as being anti-Semitic, and certainly organised public opinion as being anti-Semitic. In July 1938, to appease United States public opinion, an international attempt to resolve the refugee problem brought 32 nations and their delegates to the sophisticated spa resort of evian les bains The Irish government is deeply grateful to the governments of the United States and France. Although every effort is being made by the government to expedite industrialization, every year numbers of young people are forced by circumstances to migrate. While such emigration remains imposed upon our national economy, it's obvious that we can make no real contribution to the resettlement of refugees. Irish attitudes followed international trends, but in the nine months prior to the war, Britain accommodated 40,000 Jewish refugees, in addition to 11,000 granted admission before November 1938, of whom over 10,000 were children. On the other hand, whilst advocating restriction and remaining mealy-mouthed in condemnation of the Hitler regime, the Irish government did commence to coordinate rescue work. On the 1st of November 1938, the Irish Coordinating Committee for Refugees was formed from members of the Church of Ireland Jews Society, the Jewish Standing Committee for Refugees, and the Irish Committee for Austrian Relief. 
Jews could only act as observers in this committee, but not as members. And accordingly, our representatives who went there on behalf of Jews were not allowed to speak on behalf of Jews. The committee were doubtless sincere in their efforts, but they perceived Christian non-Aryans, a spurious Nazi racial classification denoting Christians with some distant Jewish ancestry, as more deserving than professing Jews, a conviction echoed by the committee's official statement of intent. The coordinating committee has already submitted certain proposals for the settlement in this country of refugees from Germany and Austria. These proposals relate only to Christians with Jewish blood. The coordinating committee are of the opinion that this country should confine its efforts to such persons. As there are adequate funds subscribed by the Jewish communities in other countries to deal with the cases of professing Jews. The age old stereotype of the wealthy Jew obscuring the fact that all the donations in the world were of no use whatsoever if Jews could not gain entry into other territories. I was approached by a fairly tall, sallow faced man with a black Hamburg and a long black coat who introduced himself to me as a refugee, an Austrian. I wanted to uh, secure permission for his remaining in the city with us. I went to interview S Senator Dowdall. I told him that we were prepared to put up a reasonably large sum of money to start a cheese manufacturing business because this man was a cheese manufacturer. I told him that he would train operatives in the manufacture of cheese and at the end of the war would leave the country. And if Senator Dodo promised to do his best, he went to Dublin and in a few days I received a telegram advising me that my friend had to leave. He was given one week in which to do so. On November the 7th, 1938, 17-year-old Herschel Grinspan whose parents were amongst Polish Jews dumped by the Germans in appalling conditions in no man's land on the Polish border, shot and killed a minor German diplomat, Ernst von Rath, in Paris. Between the night of the 9th and 10th of November, all over Germany, synagogues were burned in a spontaneous orchestrated attack. Over 7,000 Jewish businesses were destroyed, some 100 Jews murdered, thousands subjected to wanton violence and sadistic torments, and about 30,000 men incarcerated in Buchenwald, Dachau, and Sachsenhausen. Shards of broken glass littering the streets gave the night its name, Kristallnacht. World condemnation was swift. This meeting of Irish workers expresses its horror at the religious and racial persecution at present being carried out by the German government. It condemns in the strongest measure organized hooliganism against religion and it calls upon the government of ERA to use its endeavors to prevent further persecution of Christians and Jews in Central Europe. No official statement came from the Irish government. Six days later, however, an editorial in the Irish press, founded by Fianna Fáil, commented, No believer in humanity or justice will defend the treatment that has been meted out to the unfortunate Jews in Germany. Neither can any defense be put forward for the bombing of hut villages in India by British aeroplanes or the dynamiting of blocks of houses in Palestine by way of reprisals. How many synagogues were actually burned down? A total of 101 synagogues have been destroyed by fire, 76 demolished, 7,500 shops damaged to property, equipment and stock is estimated at several hundred million marks. I wish you had killed 200 Jews instead of destroying so many valuables. There are 35 dead. I suggest we use the following wording, that the Jews, as a punishment for their abominable crimes, etc., etc., are made to contribute 
a hundred thousand marks. That will do the trick. What emerged in Ireland was a seeming lack of real sympathy and concern for what Jews were experiencing in Germany and for the thousands seeking refuge elsewhere. Jewish refugees will be allowed to settle in this country only when their presence can be regarded as an advantage to this country. Accordingly, each case is considered on its merits. The main feature of alien law in Britain and Ireland required that aliens could be deported if necessary, as under Nazi law non-Aryans were debarred from re-entering Germany, you could hardly deport people to a country that would not accept them. An Irish Times headline, Ireland Helps Christian Refugees, summed it up. In addition, Jewish refugees seeking admission to Ireland had to face the extra hurdle of Charles Bewley, Ireland's representative in Berlin from 1933 to 39. Anti-Semitic and an unapologetic admirer of Hitler, Bewley tended to minimise the implications of the Nuremberg Laws, referring to them as certain inconveniences to which they are subjected as members of the Jewish race. His appointment to Berlin placed him in a key role in relation to Jews trying to leave Germany, the irony of which appears to have been lost on his superiors. Complaints arose about serious delays in the processing of refugee applications through Berlin. Asked to report on conditions and attitudes to Jewish immigration in various countries, he replied, The chief supporters of communism are almost invariably Jews, whose commercial activities have been marked by a want of scruple. Governments have felt themselves compelled to intervene against the usury and fraud of Jewish moneylenders, employers and middlemen. No one with even a superficial knowledge of German can be ignorant that the appalling moral degradation before 1933 was, if not caused by Jews, at least exploited by Jews. Jewish emigrants in the countries which they've been permitted to enter have created and are creating brave moral scandals and are a source of corruption of the population among which they dwell. It is impossible to take up with any degree of reason that attitude that they should be treated like ordinary citizens of the country. He went on to emphasize his belief that many applicants seemed not only unsure of their destinations, but lied about their circumstances. The members of the Irish Coordinating Committee are irresponsible in not ensuring whether or not Dr. Regensberger has a criminal record in the future. I presume the department would require that genuine inquiries are made in order to at least ensure that an influx of convicted criminals does not take place. I think we have to see Charles Bewley in the context of a wider and uh, latent anti-Semitism within Irish society and the Irish civil service, that there were others, such as Roach, the secretary of the Department of Justice, who uh, had a degree of anti-Semitism in, in their personality. And so Bewley must be seen in this context. Uh, Jews were seen, along with uh, communism and Freemasonry, as the three great specters in interwar Europe. So um, Bewley was perhaps left in, in, in situ because maybe members of the Department of External Affairs uh, sympathized, or at least um, had an understanding of, of his policies, uh, that he is not alone. We had had a letter from Marcus Whitston saying, everything fine, visas have been granted, we took the night sleeper train from Vienna to Berlin. We went to the Irish Embassy. We opened the door and were welcomed, very friendly, by a fairly tall, good-looking German woman, a blonde in her early 40s. He said, yes, what can I do for you? So we announced, we are the class from Vienna. And she said, yes. I said, well, we, we, we are here to fetch our visa. He said, what visa? I said, well, look, here's a letter from Ireland. This is from a Mr. Whitstum, who has talked to the Irish Foreign Office. And he says, go to Berlin, collect your visa, everything's ready. So she went through all her files. She looked and she looked and she looked. And she said, I'm sorry, I have no notification whatever. As far as I'm concerned, uh, there's nothing I can do. But I'll tell you what. I'll get in touch with Dublin, and you keep phoning me, and I'll tell you what I can say. And then one day she actually rang up and said to mother, could she please come and see her? So 
mother went and came back and said Frau Kamberg had told her why we haven't got the visa is simply that the Irish government does not want to let any Jews into the country until the machinery of Hirsch Ribbons is securely on its way to Ireland. So refugees as such, no, but once the machinery is on its way, and this has been confirmed, yes, then the visas will be given. We could hear the screaming from the street, I mean the screaming of the SA, the stormtrooper, smashing up everything within the site and uh, emptying Jewish flats, throwing everything out and beating up Jews. And next morning, mother was called to the telephone. And at the other end was Frau Kamberg, who said, Miss, uh, Frau Klar, the visa have arrived. I've got them. Please come quickly uh, and book yourself on the plane to London tomorrow. And the sooner the better. Beauty was the first point of contact for many uh, refugees, uh, potential visa applicants, and Ireland. And so he didn't have to tell his superior, Joseph Walsh, the head of the Department of External Affairs, that applications had come through. It, when a visa was granted, it was within his power to, um, to stop uh, the visa or to simply sit on it, uh, misfile it, or uh, lose it um, for a, a period of time. Yes, Frau Kamberg, when we fetched the visas, made a remark to my mother saying, actually, they have been here for a few days, and but seeing what happened last night, I talked to the minister and I got him to release them. He was sitting on them. Sucked into the vortex of Nazi racial theories, his ineptitude at running the Irish legation was causing severe worries at home. Now, why external affairs didn't recall him earlier, I don't know. I presume it's because there was a, the lack of a suitable diplomat to replace him. And anyway, if he had been recalled, what could have been done with him? De Valera left him there for that length of time. De Valera was the Minister for External Affairs. He should never have been uh, allowed to stay there until 1939 because he went through the very worst years. And during those very bad years, he was in a position to um, make decisions which may or may not have led indirectly to the deaths of people. I'm convinced that the decision to leave him there was one of the worst personnel decisions that has been made since the foundation of the state. Interned by the Americans at the war's end, he was eventually released through the intercession of external affairs who advised the British, release him with a kick in the pants and let him make his own way back to Ireland. In 1939, one person who managed to slip the net from Warsaw to Ireland was the then 18-year-old Sabina Shorts. When I got the letter from my father that I should go to Ireland, and he wrote the letter, a fictitious letter, that my aunt is very, very sick, very ill, and she only has about three, three weeks to live. And if you don't come and she wants to see you, your favorite niece, so I, so I didn't know what to do, because I knew you can't get a visa to Ireland. You can't get a visa to England anyway. The British consul represented Ireland, and I went down there. I saw a big queue, and I didn't know what to do. So I went in, and I said, look, it's only three weeks. My passport is four weeks. I have to come back. I must come back. I was crying and everything, and then eventually put the stamp on. Well, I could not believe when I came home, when he said one thing, he said, you will not go to England. Any other country you can take a visa, but not to England. And it took us a very long time to go to Dublin. My father was there, and he took me to an address on the South Circle Road. After four weeks, detectives came. They said, you have to leave the country. Your four weeks are and what I'm going to do and where I'm going to go. He said, you're going to go to Belfast. 
Oh God, I said, where's Belfast? Where's a part of, our, of England or so and so? I said, but I can't go to England. I haven't got a visa to England. But that will be all right. You have to go. But the detective came back. And he said to me, look, Ms. Vishniak, you go to Indian Street. You go one or two stations. And after the two stations, you come back. But I didn't know what he meant, you come back. And then later on, he said, no, you don't need to. Just stay here put. The policy of the government towards refugees and towards aliens was based on the defense of national interest, very narrowly defined. Ireland was a country of high unemployment. Ireland was a country of heavy emigration. Ireland was a country where those who had trained for the professions couldn't uh, get positions, they had to go abroad. And these were the interests you had to protect. And that was clearly defined in 1938 by the Irish representative at the Evian Conference. And there was no great deviation from that particular policy by the Department of Justice. They stuck very rigidly to uh, that very restricted, what I've described as illiberal and ungenerous policy. Humanitarianism, where did that enter into their calculations in the late 1930s and early 40s? The short answer is that once you define the policy, you are left with a situation where you shuffle files. Rabbi Frankel, our file 69 stroke 2495. The Jewish community in this country should not be increased by way of immigration. So long as we have the problem of unemployment, I feel that it would be wrong to admit aliens about whom we cannot be certain that they will not compete with our own citizens in the labor market. On the particular matter of religious ministers, I should like to see a greater effort towards self-reliance. It may interest you to know, the National College of Art in Dublin has appointed as its professor of design, Gaelic, a Dutchman as its professor of sculpture, an Austrian, as its assistant professor of sculpture, an Englishman. Our instructor of music in the army is a German, our director of the museum, an Austrian. Mr. P. Harrison of 26 Eustace Street, Dublin, has applied for permission for his niece, Miss Ita Kogan, a Romanian national residing in Paris, to enter this country. The applicant is a Jew, and, as it is thought, his real motive is to gain admittance for his niece with a view of establishing her here permanently, the Department of Justice has refused the application. There was no entry to any other countries. There was only one exit to the concentration camps. That's all. There was no other entry to other, to, to other countries. They would not let you in. And that's all. No one. Ireland should not be judged out of context. What Ireland was doing was terrible. It was wrong. We should have been showing an example to the rest of the world. I agree with all that. But what Ireland was doing was no different to what all the other countries in much better economical situations could have done. <laughs> I am speaking to you tonight because I thought you would expect me to. You know from the news bulletins to which you have been listening that the great European powers are again at war. We resolved that the aim of our policy would be to keep our people out of the war. Following the outbreak of war, some two million Jews came under German rule. Millions would not survive. Any emotive issue which threatened the maintenance of Ireland's declaration of neutrality now had to be avoided. Jewish refugee aliens were particularly problematic. Taking them in was viewed by the German government as tacit sympathy, which in turn implied criticism of Germany. Attempts to reach Ireland now had to clear not only the usual channels, but also be approved by G2, military intelligence. Supremos Liam Archer and Dan Bryan viewing aliens as a threat to the fragility of neutrality, were vehemently opposed to their admission. 
Officials were now being asked to apply humanitarian principles to a raggle taggle of humanity with little to recommend it by bureaucratic standards. They could not be deported to their original country. In essence, they had no rights. In effect, they were non-persons. Aliens must be in possession of a document enabling them to return to their country of origin. An impossibility for those Jews now under German control. Alien refugees will not receive permission to enter or reside in Ireland unless they were recommended by the Irish Coordinating Committee. In view of the war conditions and the number of aliens to whom permission has already been granted, the committee is not making any recommendations at present. Yet exceptions were made, intentionally or otherwise. How else does one account for the fact that in June 1940, 356 Germans were in this country, 150 classed as refugees? Mr. Victor Weinberg, applying to come to Ireland on business, has revealed to me that his wife and children are stranded in the Czech Protectorate and that his trip to Ireland would entail exploration of the possibility of acquiring a job so he could bring his family in. His application has been refused. As the German Blitzkrieg rolled across Europe, Joseph Walsh, Secretary of External Affairs, pessimistic about Britain's chances of victory, stated... It appears to be entirely within the probabilities that we shall have to deal with the German government without any hope that we can look to another government for support. In the circumstances, the less cause we give for irritation to the German government, the better. In the case of the two children, Sabina and Moises Sparak, if the journey of these children to Ireland to rejoin their father is going to be used as a means of saddling us with another adult alien, the likelihood is they will have to stay where they are. A very striking feature of attitude towards Jewish uh, aliens in Ireland during the war and Jewish citizens is the fear that in some sense they're connected with international Jewry, which is to say that they're connected with Zionism, with the move toward acquiring and establishing a home for the Jewish people in the Middle East. During the war, there was a fear that, in a sense, if people were Jewish, how could they be 100% Irish? How could you be a good Jew uh, and a good Irishman? And nobody turned, within official circles turned that argument around to saying, well, how could you be a loyal American citizen and a good Irish American? Serge Philipson had been working in Ireland since 1937 as general manager of Les Modes Modernes in Galway. By 1942, his wife Sophie, partly due to her own ineptitude, and partly because she was snared in a nightmarish net of bureaucratic regulations, found herself, with her daughter and other members of the family, cornered in occupied France. Mrs Philipson, who held a Polish passport with an Irish visa granted in 1940, but now expired, thought it wiser to come to Ireland. She and her husband wrote increasingly desperate letters requesting a visa extension. I see no possibility, whatever, of my being of any assistance to those people as neither of them holds an Irish passport, and as they are presumably Jews, I doubt whether any intervention would in any event succeed. September the 21st, 1942, Justice to External Affairs. Visas granted to these persons should be extended. Mr. Philipson has produced evidence that passages from Lisbon to Shannon have been booked with Herr Lingus Tjolenthal. Mr. Philipson has undertaken to defray the costs of any telegrams which you may find it necessary to send to Vichy or Lisbon. 21st of December, 1942, Vichy. I have the honour to inform you that the visa granted to Mrs. Philipson was not extended as her passport was not submitted to the legation in a valid condition. Mrs. Philipson was now officially stateless. Serge Philipson continued to press for news of his wife and child. Then, June 1943, both well, can with brother. Correspondence then lapsed until May 1944. It has now been learned that Madame Philipson and her mother-in-law are interned in the internment camp at Trancy, near Paris. 
As the cabling expenses involved in this matter have amounted to one pound, one shilling, seven pence, I should be glad if you would let me have a remittance for this amount at your convenience. Eventually taken by the Germans to Germany. It was terrible, it was terrible. She went out on the last, last wagon, you might say. From 1942, British politicians became increasingly aware of the specific racist nature of the massacres in Europe. News was coming through to us. We had our sources of information as to what was going on. All this was happening was being leaked and it was reaching us and we were fully aware. And you may be sure that Di Valera was advised by Jewish representatives as to what the position was. An Irish Times report by the Reverend Weir on the 25th of October, 1943, stopped by the censor, stated, Since the German occupation of Europe, two million Jews have died. Missionary sources related that the murders were carried out by means of mass shooting, mass electrocution, and mass gassings. They were not a part of war, but a deliberate attempt openly proclaimed to exterminate the Jewish population of Europe. It was a political security censorship, which was in place until May 1945, operated by civil servants, backed up by G2 military intelligence, who operated sort of a covert censorship. It covered all media and communications, postal, telegraphic, telephonic communications, film, press, books. Newspapers were very tightly controlled. Everything in relation to the war had to be submitted to the censors on the night before on, in proof. The censors went through with their blue pencils through the night excising anything which could possibly throw a bad light on either side in the war. Atrocities, in all cases, were automatically censorable. There was an absolute refusal to, to allow the war be placed in a moral framework. English newspapers were allowed in freely, and the distributors were warned if the, the papers contained bestial propaganda, as it was called, uh, of any kind against the Germans, the Italians, the Japanese, that they would be excluded. Um, as it turned out, they weren't excluded. On that basis, the only papers which were stopped were ones which criticised Irish neutrality or the position of Ireland in the war. The censors were so diligent and, you know, incredibly pedantic and so inflexible. They were operating almost as automatons. If in doubt, cut it out was the maxim that they operated under. The main purpose was to maintain this illusion, if you like, of strict, correct, unbending neutrality. As the Nazi extermination policy gained momentum, Jewish organizations frantically seeking assistance approached the few neutral countries, Switzerland, Sweden, and Ireland, for help. When Herzog, for example, first formally alerted de Valera to the horrors of the Holocaust in the latter part of 1942, when he wrote or telegrammed de Valera, which he did on a regular basis from 1942 onwards, de Valera put in motion the small diplomatic machine that he had at his disposal to help Herzog in the way that he sought help. We have been informed by a Jewish organization in London that the mere possession of a visa by a Jewish family in occupied areas of Europe was a guarantee against deportation to Poland. And although we have been unable to discover that any neutral country had given such a visa, we went again to the German government. The latter replied. We could not give visas to any Jews who had not relatives in Ireland. In the summer of 1943, Dublin and Con Kremen in the Berlin legation again applied to the Germans to be allowed to grant visas to a group of more or less prominent Jewish personalities. Police here are averse to letting anybody out of Germany. They're afraid that information might leak out. Any chance regroup of Jews in Holland and Belgium? Visas for Jews, rarely any use. Whilst Irish diplomats were being as helpful as possible, 
TD Oliver Flanagan chose to make his notorious outburst in Doyle Aaron. There is one thing that Germany did, and that was to rout the Jews out of their country. Until such time as we rout the Jews out of this country, it does not matter a hair's breadth what orders you make. Where the bees are, there is the honey, and where the Jews are, there is the money. The House made no comment. In January 1944, two further schemes were approved by de Valera and promoted by external affairs. The first in response to an appeal from his old friend, Chief Rabbi Herzog, to offer temporary shelter to 235 Polish Jewish families interned at a transit camp at Vitel in Vichy, France. The second, an American request to harbor 500 Jewish children. De Valera was very concerned about trying to preserve Irish neutrality in its strictest interpretation. And he didn't want to cause unnecessary offense to the Germans or to the Allies. There was little or nothing they could do, but the little they could do, they did attempt to do. So inevitably, uh, Kremen was going to be told, why are you interested in these people? They're not Irish citizens, they don't have relatives in this country, so why should you bother with people? Do you want to create a new problem for yourselves? And again, all the old anti-Semitic rhetoric would be sort of trotted out uh, to Kremen. And ultimately, the Germans would be left with the view that you have ulterior motives. Despite which, the Irish government responded to the United States ambassador, David Gray. We'll be glad to receive and provide haven for the 500 Jewish children. The Red Cross, asked to assist, replied positively with the proviso. It was decided to ask your department for permission to publish this. When publishing it, we shall omit the word Jewish. The children never arrived. Please inform External Affairs in Dublin that the Germans claim no knowledge of the Polish Jews at Vittel. He then learns that of the 235 Jews in question, 163 were taken away, followed by a further 51, leaving 14 who were ill and a few who committed suicide. Requested in January 1944 to obtain visas for French, Dutch, Polish and German Jewish families, external affairs cables realize there's little hope success, but it would be of great advantage for us to be in a position as soon as possible to give definite reply to constant requests from Jewish organizations to bring Jews from German Europe to Ireland. Following a strong interview with the German Foreign Office, Kremen could only respond, If it was intended that these families would become Irish citizens, the German authorities would gladly save us the inconvenience of having so many Jews. External affairs to Kremen, Berlin. A rumor has reached the Jewish community here that Germans intend at last moment extermination of all Jews in camps Auschwitz and Birkenau. In order to allay anxiety, please tell German Foreign Office we should be grateful for reassuring message about the welfare of these people. The rumor is pure invention spread by enemy sources. Please supply any news, welfare of inmates in Auschwitz and Birkenau, understood now in the fighting zone. Informed by a German official on January the 30th, the camps in question have been evacuated and the inmates transferred to another, more central camp. No mention, of course, from the German official of the forced marches that killed most of the inmates remaining alive. While Irish diplomats were playing their part in rescue attempts, Emergency Ireland provided the perfect opportunity for the emergence of groups with an anti-Semitic agenda. From the mid-30s and continuing through the war, such groups were encouraged by Italian and German sources to adopt a social crusade to rid Ireland of the parasites. The Irish Christian Rights Protection Association was established by George Griffin in 1937. To preserve and foster a state based on Christian principles and to build an Ireland suited to the needs of her people, wholly free from non-Christian domination. Griffin proceeded in 1940 to co-found the more virulently anti-Semitic People's National Party, a pseudo-Nazi group. Walter Altwina, Hasher is another one. 
Uh, they did certainly a degree of overt anti-Semitism within them, and they tended to be uh, pro-Nazi and pro-Italian fascist. It's certainly in 1940, at the apogee, if you like, of uh, organized anti-Semitism, when it looks as though there'll be a German invasion, you get Gerald Griffin and others uh, linking the need to get rid of the Jews and to let the Germans in with the need to, to remove the, the stranglehold of the moneylender uh, from the Catholic Irish to be replaced, as we now know, by the stranglehold of the uh, Catholic Irish moneylender, uh, altogether a less agreeable chap. Penapa, the organ of the People's National Party, persisted in printing anti-Jewish material, crowning it with a front cover not submitted to the censor. A police sergeant who infiltrated a PNP meeting reported Griffin as stating, German cruelties and the persecution of Jews was nothing but a, a fabrication of lies that it was the Jews who were responsible for the circulation of uh, such stories. Uh, there were at present 27,000 Jews in the country, and before the termination of the war, there would be a fall at 27,000 here if action was not taken. Well, and then a, a, a Mr. Holden stated that it was the Jews they were after, and everything must be done to make their lot miserable and to get them out of the country. Well, and then a, a young lady played the... Uh, soldier song in the German national anthem on the uh, piano and uh, some of them raised their hands in a salute like uh, like this doubtless the jittery international climate contributed to a hardening of local attitudes to the Jew cast as the alien and perceived as breaking out from Europe to swamp receiving societies but the pertinent question is how many Jewish refugees did Ireland admit during the Nazi years I never heard about thousands. All I will tell you, insofar as that is concerned, it became known that I had a connection with the refugee problem. And letters began to pour into my office from Jewish people all over Germany and Austria. They were horrible, horrible, with girls who appeared to work as, as maid servants to scrub floors to do anything at all. It's, wrote excellent English, had several languages, could teach. No, couldn't get them in, couldn't get them in. In a post-war draft memorandum, Peter Berry of Justice stated, An application made in 1939 that part of the overall quota of refugees approved for admission by government be allotted to persons of Jewish race and religion was refused. This approach was renewed on a number of occasions. The applications were refused. Mrs. Olga Eppel, Irish representative of the indefatigable English rabbi Schoenfeld, maintained that during the years 1933 to 45, admission was secured for only 60 Jewish refugees, of whom, during its nine years, the coordinating committee appears to have obtained sanction for 42. There is no doubt that Irish policy discriminated against Jews. On the 25th of October 1946, Roach of Justice was still able to write, Our practice has been to discourage any substantial increase in the Jewish population. They do not assimilate with our own people, but remain a sort of colony of a worldwide Jewish community. This makes them a potential irritant in the body politic and has led to disastrous results from time to time in other countries. What role did Eamon de Valera, who retained the external affairs portfolio, play in all of this? De Valera himself was criticised and attacked by General Mulcahy as, a, as an illegitimate and as a Jew. And de Valera's recorded response to that, that he was neither illegitimate nor a Jew, and that whilst he prayed for the Jewish people, that was his entire concern. Journalist Robert Fisk claims that the only surviving document recording any reference to Jews by de Valera is a memorandum written by the German ambassador Hempel before the war. When the question of Jewry in Germany was briefly touched on, and I said that National Socialist Germany's procedure against the Jews must primarily be explained by the behaviour of the Jews after the 1418 war, Mr de Valera merely answered briefly that he was fully aware of this. Reported to have been aware of what was happening to the Jews of occupied Europe pretty early on, no wartime evidence appears, save his speech condemning the German invasion of Holland and Belgium, that he ever uttered any condemnation of German atrocities. 
the destruction of the architecture of Rome, for example, in 1944, and the threat to Rome elicited far more diplomatic action and public statement from, from de Valera than the Holocaust. I think we've got to set in context uh, the problems that de Valera had as the foreign minister and as Taoiseach during the war years. It was a particularly busy time, and he was particularly busy with those two portfolios, apart from actually trying to run the government. So trying to run the internal affairs of the Department of Justice on a daily basis was something that was simply beyond his capability. De Valera did, at the end of the war in 1945, December 45, uh, state that he was prepared to admit 10,000 refugees and he had that put into the minutes of the interdepartmental record. I believe that that was his way of telling the Department of Justice that they had to behave in a more liberal fashion in interpreting uh, Irish refugee policy. In 1946 Jewish refugees were still a thorny issue a London Jewish society purchased Clonan Castle in County Westmeath, where they proposed to bring 100 Polish Jewish orphans between the ages of 7 and 16. Despite their guarantee to undertake entire responsibility for the children, Minister for Justice Jerry Boland refused. It has always been the policy of the Minister for Justice to restrict the admission of Jewish aliens, for the reason that any substantial increase in our Jewish population might give rise to an anti-Semitic problem. De Valera held that permission should be granted, but it took a visit from Rabbi Herzog, now Chief Rabbi of Palestine, before a positive commitment was given. On the understanding that they would be removed to some other country as soon as arrangements could be made. All in sharp contrast to the unimpeded admission of over 1,000 non-Jewish children under the auspices of the Irish Red Cross between 1945 and 46 plus similar courtesies granted to several prominent pro-Axis activists. There was a very large, very popular, very impressive campaign to send food and clothing uh, to the stricken cities of Germany after the Second World War. Uh, I remember myself as a child uh, being told, uh, think of the starving children in Germany, you know, uh, eat up your food and be glad of it. But uh, the, the Jews were not discussed one way or the other. The old anti-Semitic thing was still operating as late as 1947-48. Following Adolf Hitler's suicide, the Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera, expressed his condolences in person to Ambassador Hempel. A deeply wounding gesture to the millions who had suffered in the war, it was interpreted widely as showing a total lack of understanding or acceptance of the moral values of the war against Nazism. As details of the atrocities were revealed, there remained a reluctance among part of the Irish public to believe what had happened. Some went so far as to suggest the pictures of the skeletal remnants of Belson were in fact British propaganda, provoking an Irish officer in the British Army to write to the Irish Times. All the facts are absolutely true. Folks in Ireland need to be badly shaken. They do not understand the horror of this war. They have spun their own little cocoon and have been indifferent to a great extent to the sufferings of humanity. Stiller, stiller, skvelm kval, uns in hearts arum. Bis der Teuer wird nicht fallen, sein mir muss nicht tun. Frei nicht Kind sich, sie ist ein Schmeichel, jetzt vor uns verrat. Sehen dem Frühling soll der Säune wie in Harpstabula. So der Qual sich ruhig fließen, stille sei ohne Hoch. Mit der Freiheit kommt der Tate, schloss ihr Kind meins Schloss. Wie die Wille, aber Freite, wie die Bäume grün beneite, 
Leuchtschein, Freiheit, Licht auf dein 